Good morning. It is a good morning. It's good that we are all gathered here together this day, this time, this place. As we begin this morning, um, if you haven't already done so, I'm going to invite you to take a moment to fill out those uh, friendship pads along the end of the pew, and then you can pass them on down around the bend, across the gaps. Everybody has a chance to sign, and, and then as it makes its way back, you get to see who you're sharing the pew with this morning. Uh, if you have hearing aids, uh, if you've got the switch, you can flip it over to the T-coil, take advantage of the new system. If you don't have that switch in your hearing aid or you just need some help pulling the voices out of the, the reverberation in the background here, you can let the ushers know we have some headsets you can use that also work off the T-coil and, and help with that. Continue to thank folk for the name tags. Those are really helpful as we work to connect the faces and names. That's a good help. Uh, any guests this morning, we invite you to grab one of the welcome bags, either off the back of the, the table in the back or off the welcome center. Our way of saying thank you for being present and enriching our worship today with your presence this morning. In your bulletin, uh, you've got uh, an insert that talks about the UMCOR Ink Gathering gifts. Um, take a moment to look through that if you've done this in the past because they've made some changes, and the changes are listed out here. Uh, when you get those completed, you can bring them to the church here and, and put them on the shelves just outside the, the door here, and uh, our group that's working with that will gather them up, get them sorted, and get them ready for, for delivery uh, with that. You also have our insert, our salmon color insert that talks about all the different adult education opportunities we have starting up uh, in the fall here. Uh, Zach's been reminding us and explaining those every week. Take a moment to look through that, and if you have any questions, you can contact the name under the, the respective area, or you can get a hold of Zach, and he can answer any question you have. You can tell him I said that. Monique, were you going to make an announcement about this? Good morning. As a partner congregation with the women at the well, not only do we get to the, the blessing of hearing Pastor Lee once a year uh, share with us, we also have the opportunity to have 10 individuals worship with them uh, once a year. And so this year, uh, our date is December 27th, which is right smack between, you know, Christmas and New Year's, which at first I thought, Oh, that might, you know, be harder to get people. But I've already had six people tell me they want to go that day. So we've got four more slots uh, that are available. If it's something that you're interested in doing and that's a time of year that you might be able to do that, we'd love to have you join us. It's an incredible blessing, a wonderful experience. Um, if you haven't been before, we'll try. The people who haven't been able to do it before uh, will be given priority. Um, but if you've been before and are interested in going again, uh, please know that you're welcome to sign up and, and do that, and we'll try to get everybody worked in. So um, I'll have this list over in front of the big TV or under the big TV <laughs> if, you'd, if you'd be interested in doing that. Thank you. Okay. So while we're thinking about women in the well, I would like to make an introduction this morning. Um, Reverend Lee Schott is present with us this morning. We want to give her a good wa a welcome. Pastor Lee is the pastor that's appointed to uh, women at the well congregation there at the women's prison at Mitchellville. So we're just delighted to have you here Thank this morning. Thank you so much. You bet. She's going to be delivering the message today, so we're going to have a chance to hear some more from her in just, just a few minutes with that. Uh, Flower-wise this morning, uh, our floral arrangement on the altar is shared with us by Ray and Judy Bush. It's in celebration of their wedding anniversary. So when you see them, you can be sure to give them a happy anniversary wish as well as a, a thank you for their generosity in sharing that. The rosebud on the altar is in honor of Sawyer Paul Peterson. Now, you normally we do that at the time of birth, but it slipped right past our radar. So we figured we're going to play catch up today. And so even though uh, obviously Sawyer's been here for a day or two, uh, we're still going to celebrate. So the rosebud is in his honor today. So you guys are welcome to take that following the service uh, with that. Later in the hour, we are going to be celebrating Sawyer's baptism this morning as well uh, with that. We also have some other arrangements that are shared with us by the family of Vivian King. Uh, these are shared with us from her services that were held uh, earlier this week. Okay, do we have any other announcements? My name is Tilly Thurgood. 
I'm Pastor Dave's cousin, uh, twice removed on our mama's side. <laughs> well, we claim him whenever it's useful to us. <laughs> and how, how do you do, ma'am? Uh, good, good. Welcome here. Uh, my name's Tilly, and I come all the way from Gladbrook, Texas, just to be here. <laughs> oh, uh, my mama always told me that good Southern ladies, that they always take baked goods when they're going someplace, and I had me a real nice angel food cake, but I ride up here with our cousin Morris Mayfair, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in that crop dusting plane. It's a terrible ride, and <laughs> well, I fell asleep. And, uh, well, when I woke up, there was two pieces left. Morris was hungry, so here you go. <laughs> and, and, hi, <laughs> maybe y'all can share a little bit, you know. And uh, I'm here uh, to help out. I heard there was a need for somebody to help out with the children's sermon, so I'll do that. Okay. And I'll sit over here, just don't mind me. And I'm real glad to see you finally wised up and got some reinforcements, a real preacher. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay. Okay, is it safe? <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to try. <laughs> so the ministry spotlight this week is for our ACES, which is our Sunday school program. And we kicked everything off today in, in between the services for Rally Sunday. But the problem is we need some more volunteer teachers. And um, I know you all can do it. So we have space open in our younger grades to join teams, but we also need help, especially in our fourth through sixth sixth grade and our high school class. So Karen wanted to mention something about that. I just want to tell you, I've taught Sunday school for a long time. And at 86, I'm really a little past it with my knees. They kind of gave me a problem. But there are other people that should be able to do it. And let me tell you, it's wonderful to look back and see people that you worked with including you, <laughs> 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 and keeping tr tr in touch with these kids, even now, they are part of you. And if you want to be a part of them, teach. Yes, thank you. We also have the option, if you want to just come and enjoy and see what it's all about, you can join us for intergenerational Sundays, which are traditionally the first Sunday of the month in the Friendship Center. All generations are invited. That means everybody is invited and it needed to come and join us. Today we made slime and we uh, made Play-Doh and we played with Connects and Legos. So really, it's a time to get in touch with your inner child and be allowed and, and encouraged to do so. So if you want a, a schedule with all of the dates and look forward to coming to them, you can find them in your friendship pads, or I have extra copies available if they're not in there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm here on uh, behalf of Staff Parish for an announcement and wanted to communicate an opportunity for our church to be of assistance uh, to a neighboring congregation. And uh, my announcement this morning will be fairly brief and fairly general uh, as it's more of a notification uh, because some details are being worked out on, on the request. But um, last week, we, uh, being Pastor Dave mainly, have uh, recently received a request from our district superintendent, uh, Reverend Heechon John, and that request centers around the fact that there are more churches in our annual conference needing appointments uh, than there are available clergy. And the district has invited our church to help our neighbors at the Montezuma United Methodist Church with pulpit supply and emergency pastoral care. Um, and this would be on a temporary basis. And after discussions with our staff and careful consideration, discussions with uh, staff parish relations, um, we have uh, made the decision to accept this invitation and work is currently underway to work out the details of what that looks like. Uh, one of those details will be to compile a list of, uh, of staff and laypersons who will be able to, to be in the group and share these responsibilities on a rotating basis. And you may have some questions now. One of them might be, you might be thinking, what type of time commitment is this request all about? And uh, this will begin in October and will carry on through uh, June 30th of 2019 um, or whichever comes first. If their, their appointment comes sooner than that, then that would be great. Um, but this is one of the benefits of being a connectional church. Um, that way, no, no one congregation faces the joys and the challenges of ministry alone and uh, there'll be more information coming uh, from Staff Parish as more of the details are worked out. So, thank you. Okay. 
Thanks, Matt. Do we have any other announcements, additions, or corrections? Then I'll invite you to stand as you're able to. You can greet each other with your signs of Christian love. Good morning, Don. God bless you. Great well, thank to see you. you. Good to have you here. We minister with. Good morning. Uh, this earlier in this week, I was thinking about the upcoming um, centering moment that I had, and the word "reminder" just kept coming back into my mind. And at first, I attributed it to the fact that, hey, I've got to say something when I'm up here. Uh, but as the week pro progressed, it still that word was in my mind, and I believe more that it was a divine push to lift up that idea of reminders. And certainly in our busy lives, we have a lot of reminders available. We have our phones that can beep and let us know when you need to put the garbage out. Speaking about the guy behind me. <laughs> in fact, his phone beeps a lot, to tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> But it keeps him on track, and th there's also, like in our house, the refrigerator has a lot of uh, things on it to remind us that there are things coming up or, or food we need to buy and that sort of thing. Also, the radio, the TV will give you announcements, public service kind of announcements to remind you of uh, daylight savings time starting tomorrow. Be sure and set your clocks forward. Um, and. Uh, weather announcements too. Well, one that comes once a year that is probably not my favorite one to hear is March and they uh, lift up colorectal cancer month and be sure and schedule your colonoscopy. And uh, I have to tell you a side note, Karen Packer told me, she goes, that's really not a topic I've ever had uh, heard before. <laughs> And it made me think when Dave and I were discussing marriage, I did lift up to him that I would probably not be the typical minister's wife, and <laughs> this is a case in point. <laughs> uh, but uh, when I turned 50, I heeded the reminder, scheduled a colonoscopy, and uh, the morning of, and for you young ones that don't know the, <laughs> the wonderful world thereof, uh, the day before is the worst part, really. The procedure's not so bad, but it was that morning, the day before, and I thought, oh, I have a high school son in my household and a junior high son in my household. And the junior high son was a very social being and usually would go to multiple friends' house after school, call me up, want a ride to the next kid's house, or give me a ride, he needed a ride home, and I thought, that's not going to work. So <laughs> we sat down at breakfast, and then I said, now, Brian, uh, you need to come home today after school, straight home. Uh, you can't go to anybody's house because I've got to take some medicine, and I've got to stay at home. That's where I left it because, A, it's breakfast time, and <laughs> B, he's a junior high boy, so... I'm sure he didn't want to know all the details either. And so the day progressed. I started in on my regi regime of uh, drinking, and um, he came home when school was out, but he also came home with six friends. 
Uh, I should have told him a little more, I guess, but it, it was quite the afternoon, but we made it through. And uh, the thing about <laughs> talking about it is it's definitely a centering moment because one, there's only one thing on your mind, and B, there's only one place you want to be. <laughs> so uh, I, it came to mind and I went with it. I'm sorry, any of you that <laughs> I think it maybe is an unusual topic, and it is. But it did make me think of our scripture, which is the story of the rich young man, uh, who uh, I think he believed he was centered. He went to uh, saw Christ and asked him about what did he need do to do yet to attain eternal life. And uh, so Jesus tells him, uh, you know, the commandments, and he's like, yes. I've done those since I was a young man. Um, and, uh, you know, he had, had to know maybe there was something more, I, I believe, as you read the story. And, and Jesus pointed out to him that you need to do one more thing. You need to sell, give away all your belongings, and then come and find me and follow me. And the, the rich young man was not happy with that particular thing to do. Uh, but that's, that's the thing about reminders. We need them, but we don't always like them. Would you join me in prayer, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, for your presence here with us today. Please keep your word in our hearts and in our everyday actions. Amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Spirit of Jesus, if I love my neighbor out of my knowledge, leisure, power, or wealth, and if, when I have answered need with kindness, my neighbor rises, weakened from despair, If I am hugging safety or possessions, uncurl my spirit as your love prevails. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. And please join me in the opening prayer. In the midst of our daily lives, Jesus Christ calls us to follow him. Before we continue on the path with Jesus, we must first confess what we lack for the journey in recognition of the power of sin in our lives. God within us and God outside us, we bring before you the power of sin that creeps into our everyday possessions. Whether we wear clothes made by sweatshop labor, drink coffee picked by underpaid hands, or use products that deplete our Earth's resources, we acknowledge the injustice created by choices we take for granted. Although accustomed to ways that mean plenty for some and scarcity for others, we long for new patterns that create abundant life for all. Remembering our connection in Christ to all of our brothers and sisters and to the world you created to show us your blessings, help us to live toward a world in which only you, your justice reigns. Empty our hands that they might be yours to fill. Open our hearts from our material desires to embrace new lives as your beloved children. Loving you by loving all. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 17, 17 through 22. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This is the gospel of the Lord. All right, I think we have a very special guest for Time with Young Church. Come on up. Oh, good. Hi. Come on up. I need helpers today. All right. Oh, good. I was hoping I wasn't going to be up here all by myself. Come on up. How nice of you. Very good. Oh, this is wonderful. Look at all these young people that are so excited to be here today. I have lots of things for you to do and lots of questions for you, and I know you're all smart, so you're going to get this all real well. Now, um, can you tell me what this is? Of course it is. It's an umbrella. Now, watch this. I'm going to open this up, and there are some folks that think that you should not open an umbrella inside a building because it's bad luck. Uh, this is church. And God ranks everybody here, so we're opening it up, and there's no thing as, look, there we go, see, God's with us, no problem. Okay, would you mind holding this for me for just a little while? Okay, now, how about this thing right here, if I get out of here, what's this? Helmet. It's a helmet, what do you do with this thing? You protect it. Put it on your head. It can protect your head. You put it on your head. Does somebody want to put that on their head? They can wear that a minute. Okay. Now, what is this thing? An oven glove, an oven mitt. Okay. Well, what do you do with it? You do take things un out of the oven. Would you say something? Would you say? So you don't get burned. That's right. It, that's a very good thing. Now, why, would you mind holding that for a second? Okay. Now, this one might be a bit harder for you, considering your age. Uh, do you know what this is? It says, skin nutrition, age-defying ultimate. <laughs> What's this do? Grown-ups. <laughs> yes, again, it can protect grown-ups from getting more grown up <laughs> and <laughs> getting really old and wrinkly, and I'm thinking I need a bigger jar of this. What do y'all think? This is supposed to protect you from wrinkles, okay? Um, I have laugh lines. I do not have wrinkles, but you can hold on to this. Would you hold that for me? Okay, now, you said these all protected you from something, from rain and, oh, wait, I'm going to, thank you so much. I'm going to put that down because I want to show you something in a minute with that. Now, don't let me hit you. Hold on. Okay, I got to use all my skills here. There we go. Um, thank you for holding that. Now, protects from rain. Does it protect you from rain this way if you have it like this? No, unless you're real skinny and you want to stand underneath it. It does not work like this, right? Okay, if, if Zion does not have this on his head when he is riding his bike or skateboarding or whatever, does this work? No, no, it doesn't. You have to put it on your head, right? Okay, if you have your oven mitt, you want to hold that up there, and you're going in to get your uh, turkey out of the oven for Thanksgiving, but you don't put that on your hand, will it work? No, because I'm going to burn my hands if I don't have an oven mitt on me. And then this age-defined stuff, if it actually would work, <laughs> I do not think it does, but if it would... <laughs> If I did not put it on my face, it really wouldn't work then. At least it makes me feel better if I put it on, right? So all these things have to be used. You can't just have them and say, well, I got my umbrella, so I'm going to stay dry. I've got my helmet, so I'm going to be protected. You have to use it. Now I'm going to shift from all these things into something that's a lot more important. 
Now, I have a Bible. This Bible I've had since 1972. That's a long time ago, and I use it still every day. See? I've got markers in here. I've got pages that I like to read over and over again, paper sticking out. Now, if I have it, that's good enough, right? No, I have to use it because it's going to tell me some secrets that I need to know in life. And it's going to tell me stuff that God wants me to know. For example, this fellow right here, who's he? Jesus. It's Jesus. It's God. That's right. Look how nice. Just will take a minute and look at his face. I mean, really, look how lovely and encouraging and, oh, he just looks so friendly and loving to us. And he's got his hands out to us. And he's telling us that he is our protector. All these other things we talked about just a minute ago, they protect us, but he's the one that really does it. And yet sometimes we forget. It's like leaving your umbrella closed. We forget to call on God. You know, have you ever had to start a new uh, grade in school? I'm sure you have. And maybe you felt just a little bit nervous in your tummy, like, well, I don't know if I'm going to like it. A little scared, maybe. Jesus wants us to know he's with us all the time. But, as, as Miss Beth said earlier, we need a reminder sometimes to call on him. Oh, he's there. Don't worry, he's helping you whether you ask him or not. But it makes us feel better if we actually open up our books and read what he says, if we say a prayer to him, and then we go, yeah, that's right, I forgot. He's with us all the time. He's going to protect me just like my helmet protects me. So sometimes bad things happen, and that doesn't mean God's not with us. It just means that maybe we're supposed to learn something. Maybe that's part of his plan, but he's never, ever going to forsake us. I think that's a real comfort, don't you, to have a friend that's never going away, always going to be with you, loves you no matter what. I think that's real cool. So now, y'all, you were so good. Let's, we're going to say a prayer, and then I've got a special treat for you because you're really good thinkers. But don't tell me you were here the first time, okay? <laughs> keep it quiet, keep it quiet. Okay, so you don't have to repeat after me. You can just um, listen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessings you give us every day, especially the gift of yourself to be with us no matter what. Help us always to remember that so when we get a little nervous or scared, we can just rely on you. We ask it in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And yes, you are right. It's the same thing, but you're also smart. You get a smarty. Thank you for my helmet. Anybody want my age-defying cream? I think I don't need it anymore because it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> and here are some smarties. Here, oh, here we go. Yeah, you want to pass those around there, Zion. Just hand them out, and I'll hand out to these nice ladies. Thank you so much for coming up. What a great group of people. There you go. Oh, oh, right there. We dropped one. It's okay. Here you go, sir. There, thank you. And thanks for my helpers. All right. We'll see you next time. Do we have enough? Oh, good. Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you. Um, I am always glad to be back at Grinnell, and it's been a little bit, so uh, nice to see a number of familiar faces and some new ones. I have a table with information about Women at the Well and t-shirts, so if you're headed for fellowship time, I hope you'll stop by and uh, visit our table, and um, if you have questions, please be in touch. Uh, if you're on Facebook and you're not already on our page, Women at the Well UMC, I hope you'll go and like our page and uh, just pray with us. We put, post a lot of prayer requests there, and it means a lot to know that there are people that are carrying those alongside us, so thank you for being part of that. I was looking at this scripture and thinking about how to talk about it, and this image kept coming to my mind that comes from uh, an app I've been playing on my phone. Anybody play um, games on their phone? 
I traveled this week to Washington, D.C., and I spent a lot of time on uh, airplanes, and I kept coming back to this app because I didn't have any energy to do actually do anything productive. And um, the app is called Happy Glass. Anybody know Happy Glass? I don't even know how I got connected to Happy Glass, but it's kind of a cool app. It's like it's got this um, spout that's going to um, uh, spew out a bunch of water, and then it has a glass that's sitting underneath it in various configurations. And the glass, like, has a face on the front of it, and when it's just empty, the face looks sad. And if a little bit of water comes into it, it kind of perks up, like, just a little bit. And then if it gets all the way full, like if the water from the spout comes into the glass, which it doesn't always, and I'll explain that in a minute, if the, if the glass gets filled to a certain point, then it goes. And like little red hearts like or something kind of spew out of the top, like, oh, this is so cool. And then it'll overflow, and it's just like, it's happy glass, right? So the deal with happy glass is that the spout is here and the glass is here, but there might be an obstacle in the way, and there might be something that's going to fall and come and like fall on the top of the glass so no water can get in the glass. And so you have to like make a line that'll, you know, draw a line with your finger that will make the, um, uh, that'll make the water flow over the obstacle or keep the, the ball out of the way and so forth. So it, again and again like I kept finding myself like smiling with delight when like the fifth or tenth or thirtieth time I'd figure out how to draw the line so that the water would come out of the spout and just light up the glass and it'd be happy glass right and I was thinking about that as it relates to the scripture because it's kind of a metaphor right like God is that spout that's like pouring out life and love like from up there somewhere right and we're here, and I think sometimes we're kind of like that. We might be kind of, or we might be a little bit like, a little bit more awake. Or we might be happy glass, right? Do we have any happy glasses here today? I hope so. But I think the truth is we all could be happy glass if we could figure out, like, what's in the way between this, this outpouring of life and love that God has for us, and what is it that's cutting that off, and what would it take? to redirect where we are or to move some of that stuff out of the way so that flow could just come in and fill us like that. I see a lot of obstacles inside the prison. I was thinking about a woman I'll call Josie who was getting ready to leave prison a while back. And while she was there, she had connected with us in a lot of ways. She, was, she always came to worship. She got connected with our leadership group, our insight council. She would come and talk to me or the other pastor that works with me, and she shared some really profound and deep and personal poetry that she had written. And so I learned some things about her life and the abuse that she had suffered and the sexual assault and um, people who had betrayed her really through her poetry as much as anything. And when she was getting ready to leave prison, it was such an interesting conversation I had with her. She was so ready to go and live this life that she'd been preparing to live. She was she wanted to be done with the meth. She wanted to be, you know, like out in the world and living the kind of life that she'd seen that was possible while she was sober inside the prison. And so she sat across the, the table from me and she said, I'm, I'm so ready. It's going to be all different. And then she kind of paused or she talked a little bit more. And in, in just a moment, she said, oh, but I feel it in me. I still really want meth. Like, I know I have this craving in me. It, I don't know if I can do it. But it's going to be different this time. And, I, and she kind of went, in this conversation, she probably spent half an hour with me. I saw her go back and forth between, I, I really want this. And then this other want that she knew was an unholy want, but it was, it was there. It was real. You could say in the spirit of this passage that we heard, she went away grieving, for she had owned that blasted thing in her, that she had so many wants that were going to work against her receiving this life that God was longing to pour into her life. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, you do pour life and love into the space above and around and through us, and sometimes that gets blocked. Some of us are in that flow one day and out of it the next. Some of us don't really even know what it feels like at all. Some of us have had the joy from time to time of letting that flow through us and out to others. And there is great delight to be had. 
as we think about that through the eyes of our sisters inside the prison and through this scripture, we would ask that the words that I say and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At the prison, I've never been asked the question that man asked in our scripture this morning. Do you remember what it was? What did he say? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is heading out on some kind of a trip, and this man runs up and kneels down in front of him. I think he's kind of breathless, and he says, What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I've been asked some breathless questions at the prison, but it's never been that one. I get the more immediate questions that have to do, When am I ever going to get parole? When is the board going to say yes to me? Or, um, where am I going to live when it comes time to leave? Or am I really going to be able to stay sober? And I should take a minute. For those of you who aren't clear about what I'm doing at the prison, um, a lot of you know because I've been here many times, but it's always good to have a refresher. We're a church inside the women's prison. Think people, less than building. We have a chapel that we use there. But the church that we are is the people that gather And I'm the pastor there. It's a United Methodist Church, so in the United Methodist Church, pastors get appointed. I am appointed there in the same way that Dave is here, and um, we do what churches do. We have worship, only ours is on Thursday night. Hope to see some of you on December 27th. Um, We do missions and outreach and pastoral care, uh, a really active reentry program, a lot of ways that we work with people inside and outside the prison. And it probably wouldn't surprise a lot of us to think that our sisters there, these incarcerated women, might be asking questions about how to get right, how to make things right. What does it take? What will it look like to kind of get my life on track? Like Josie, the one that I told you about who was leaving prison, or I could tell you about Alice and Rose, all the names I use are changed, who were wishing that they were leaving like Josie was. They just got word from the parole board in the last week or so that they're not leaving. One of them, not for six months at least. Another one will be up again in another year. We can imagine people who've been in trouble, we we might assume that maybe we hope that they are asking these kinds of questions about, okay, how am I going to get this figured out? But I wonder if it maybe is supposed to surprise us that it's a wealthy man in this story who comes to Jesus with a question like that. If you know this passage, you might know it sometimes gets referred to in our Bibles, you know, the little headings. It probably says, the rich young ruler. Um, It's funny that it's in three of the Gospels. One of them says he's young. One of them says he's a ruler. And they all say he's rich. So those all get kind of added together, and we refer to him kind of, no matter how we come to him, as the rich young ruler. I had a pastor once who just used the word, the name rich, to describe him. So I'm going to use that too. Um, Rich is the guy who comes and falls at Jesus' feet. And I think we're supposed to notice the rub of it being rich who comes running to Jesus to ask this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You don't ask a question like that if you think you already have it. But Rich has got the world by the tail. He can probably have anything he wants on earth. He's doing all the right things. He's going to tell us that in a minute. There's nothing out of his reach. And yet, here Rich comes asking Jesus, in essence, I think the question is, am I okay? I don't think you ask a question like this. You don't ask Jesus a question like this unless you have a sense that you're not in that flow of what God is trying to pour out on us. Have you been there? Rich throws himself in front of Jesus. He blurts out this question, Good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And just like always, Jesus doesn't answer the question. He deflects the good part of good teacher. He starts talking about the commandments, kind of, well, you know the commandments. I think, like, Jesus is tying his shoes, and he's just kind of talking. Maybe, I suppose, he was buckling his sandals. Um, But Jesus starts talking about the commandments, and I think Rich is kind of glad when the conversation goes that direction because that's a scorecard that works pretty well for him. No murder, check. No adultery, check. No stealing, I'm good there, and so forth. And when Jesus pauses to take a breath, 
even not before he gets through all the Ten Commandments, Rich jumps in and he says, dude, I've got all those covered ever since I was a kid. And then he stands there waiting like some kind of eager puppy, ready to receive a treat because he's done the right thing. And this is when Jesus gives him a treat? No, this is when Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own, give the money to the poor, then come and follow me. Jesus only just met this man, and he sees, just looking at him, that one blasted thing that's keeping him stand, from standing in the flow of life and love that God wants to pour out on him. It's one huge blasted thing, isn't it? Josie that I told you about, she left after that conversation where she totally confessed how conflicted she was about the math, how worried she was that she wouldn't be able to stay away. I wasn't too surprised when she came back to prison maybe 14 months later. When Josie came back, I saw that she was on the list, but I hardly saw her. I bumped into her one day in the yard early on, but then she didn't come to worship. She didn't come back to our council. She explained to me when she was getting ready to leave again that she had decided to do everything different this time around. The way she had it worked out, clearly what she did the first time didn't work, so during this day she wouldn't do any of the same things. It was such a superstitious approach. It explained why I hadn't seen her. I thought when she said it, I don't think coming to church was that dang thing that got in the way of your plans, Josie. Sometimes when we try to name the problem, we pick the wrong culprit. Jesus doesn't. Jesus looks at the man, at Rich, and sees that blankety-blank thing, the wealth, the self-absorption that it represents. And I must say, when Jesus says, sell everything, give it all away, when Jesus gives that answer, I don't think Jesus is saying, Okay, dude, you've done this and this and this and, you know, all these commandments and this and this. And now if you just do this one additional thing, give everything away, you will have tipped the balance and now God will claim you. It doesn't work that way. I said before, I don't think Jesus answered the question the man knelt there and asked, which was about what do I have to do? I think Jesus was telling him, Here's what's getting in the way of you receiving what God's already pouring out on you. It's the barrier between rich and the spout. And it's why he isn't feeling it. It's why he's asking this question in the first place. Something in him knows there's a gap. Father, Greg Bo Father Gregory Boyle, who wrote Tattoos on the Heart, I don't know if you know him, he was in Iowa this weekend, I heard him tell about Henry Nouwen, who is a well-known kind of author and mystic. Uh, someone asked Henry Nouwen, what is ministry? And Nouwen, who didn't answer the question either, the person said, what is ministry? And Henry Nouwen said, can you receive people? Those words have been ringing in my ears ever since I heard it. Can you receive people? Because actually this is something I talk about, something I wonder about as a person, and for us as churches, this exchange makes me think of us as churches falling at Jesus' feet and say, good teacher, what do we need to be doing? It's a new Sunday school year. We're worried about this, this, what's happening in our church, both locally and the future of the United Methodist Church. And I think Jesus might say something that would help us see there's this constant flow. But can we receive people? Jesus might help us notice how we don't really see the people right in front of us or right next door. We only see what's wrong with them. We might miss the gifts that they are trying to offer. I couldn't see this so clearly before I went to the prison. Serving at Women at the Well has taught me to receive people, and not because I'm good at it. I'm not. I'm a task person. I want to put a list together and make a plan. I pretty much, when I went there and I knew I was going to be sitting across from women who were going to come with whatever they were carrying, I pretty much had to say, God, what do I do here? And to, to use Nowen's word, I think God said, just be with her. Just receive her. And somehow, I have learned to a point anyway to do that. 
to not sneer when Josie tells me about her superstitious solution to how to not come back to prison again. I'm a better pastor. I'm a better human being because of the ways God has said to me, come on, Lee, how are you going to receive what and who I'm pouring out upon you? Father Gregory Boyle says the answer is something like this. We have to learn to stand in awe of what people carry rather than in judgment of how they carry it. I went to prison and wondered how I was going to love these people because I knew they'd made choices that I would never have made, or at least I thought that. But I've learned to be in awe that they're still standing with everything they've been through, almost everybody, things that I don't know how they managed. We learn to stand in awe of what people carry rather than in judgment of how they carry it. I think those are good words, whether we're talking about the church or public policy or our own families, maybe even that person that we see when we look in the mirror. What if we were in awe of what we, of what we carry rather than judgment of how we carry it? I see these words in Mark's telling of this story. This man looks up at Jesus with these anxious eyes and he's pounding hard, and before Jesus tell, tells him, okay, here, this is what's in the way. This is the dang thing that's got you in its grip. Your wealth that you hold on to with white-knuckled intensity. Before Jesus says all that, do you remember what Mark takes the time to tell us? Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at this man whom he must have known was going to go away sad, not able to really do what Jesus was going to ask him to do, at least not right then. Still, Jesus looks at him, sees him, loves him. Seeing another human being, there's love in that. Awe of what they carry rather than judgment of how they carry it. It's what I think we learn to do through Women at the Well. It's what will move some of you to give today and after today to help us keep doing what we're doing. It's the thing that will keep you connected to us, doing out here what we do there. We're so grateful for the ways Grinnell United Methodist Church has done that for so many years. It's what I got to do with Josie that day she came to talk, just hours before she was going to be released a second time. I didn't flinch when she talked about her superstitious strategy about how she was going to do everything different this time. I didn't say, wow, Josie, I would have thought more prayer, more church would have been a better plan. Instead, I looked at her. And I loved her. And I told her that. I said I missed her. I said um, that I was with her. That, and I helped her know that my care, our care for her, didn't depend on how she decided to spend this time. None of that could be changed. It didn't waver for her decisions. And I could see on her face, as I said this, she was surprised. She thought I'd be mad at her or think this was silly. She was surprised when I could look at her and love her. If I'd had Father Boyle's words, I would have said them to her. I'm in awe of what you carry, Josie, and I'm never going to judge you for the way you choose to carry it. So, friends, never doubt this. There is this flow of love pouring out from God to us endlessly, unchangeably, no matter what we do, it's always going to come. And it is my prayer that is, if there's some obstacle, some dratted thing in the way of that flow between us and God, that we'll notice it, we'll see what it is, and we'll figure out what is the thing that will help move that out of the way so that flow can come into us. And we can be like that happy glass and, you know, like joy and, and happiness and sparkles flowing up into the air. And once we've done that, then we get to overflow. We become agents of that flow, missionaries of it, to make it happen for others that we receive. We receive that flow, and then we receive the people and share that out to others. And I guarantee you, when, we, when you begin to look at those folks, receiving them and then pouring that out to them, they're going to be surprised at the love and the care that you offer them. And along the way, we're going to be surprised, too, that it was in us all along. May it be so. God bless you. Amen. It's our joy this morning. Yeah, family and sponsors, come on forward. It's our joy this morning to be able to celebrate in the sacrament of baptism this morning. 
Uh, you'll find that in the, your bulletins a little bit, in the screens on the, on the walls there, but also in your hymnal on page 39. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is through the sacrament of baptism that we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. This is God's gift offered to us without price. On behalf of the whole church, uh, hold on. Where's my pen? <laughs> oh, here. On behalf of the congregation, I present Sawyer Paul Peterson, who was brought by his parents, Jed and Kara Peterson, and his sponsors, Shay and Jordan Beck, for baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you now, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to peoples of all ages, nations, and races. Will you nurture Sawyer in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Do you, as Christ's body the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Sawyer now before you in your care? With God's help, yeah. we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Sawyer with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and Sawyer who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his days, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in Christ's final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen.
baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you're made of the Holy Spirit and our work within you that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gary, I want you to take a moment here. I want you to look out at all of these people because today they're here for you. They mean everything to you. Now it is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend Sawyer Paul Peterson to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace all of your days. Amen. <laughs> Let's welcome you. <laughs> I'd like to invite all of our third graders up. track you down if you want. You all need to stand. I'll come down and talk to you. All right. So we all just saw something very special that happened here with the baptism and how our congregation spoke to them and the family and talked about how they were always being here and supporting them and loving them and growing with them, right? Well, today we're going to have something else that's very special for our congregation, and that is we have a special gift for you. And they're sitting right there. Do you know what those are? Your third grade Bibles, yeah. This year we did something really awesome and, and very different. So do you remember when Miss Tilly was up here and she was had her Bible? And she opened it and she was talking to you about how she wrote in it and how it's all bent and frayed, and she marked some Bible verses and stuff. Well, we think that's really important, too. So much so that if you look in the Bibles that you're going to get, we started that for you. So we talked to Pastor Dave and to Zach, and I have some things in there, too, and your third grade teachers for Sunday school this year, each of them were able to make a bookmark or their sticky notes or there's things in, in the Bible throughout the whole thing that you will find and discover that are important to each one of us. And we hope that as you go through there, that you can do the same thing, that you can underline and make notes with and highlight and mark all the things that you find that's important. And maybe it will help you as you read. If something's really, really boring, you might find a note of encouragement to keep reading because it's always important, even when there's parts that might get a little sleepy in there. So I want you to look out on all of those faces out there, just like Pastor Dave what did with the with our new Sawyer baby friend. All of our friends out here, they also should have their own Bible. If they don't, I can get you one. 
And they're all growing and learning together with you. And they all can answer questions. And they all can ask questions to you because we all have our own questions. And um, part of what's in the Bible, too, that we're going to give you is our definition of being a disciple, which is being a learner, always learning and growing in God and in our faith. So I encourage you, and I encourage you all, to be in dialogue, to be in conversation, and to grow together, and to read these new Bibles together so that they're old and frayed, just like Miss Tilly's. All right? seems fitting that on this rally day as we baptize, as we give out third grade Bibles, we also ask all of our teachers to please stand. So if you're involved with TAG as a volunteer, or the nursery as a volunteer, or in ACES or Sunday school, if you would please stand so that we may dedicate and install you all. Today we remember that all are called to teach and learn and serve one another as we grow in our faith. As we gather, we recognize, too, that there are those who have responded to a specific call of God to become workers in the life of the church. Those called to these ministries need our loyal support and our prayers. We ask, too, for God's blessing upon this congregation of learners. Thank you. You may be seated. We come to the gang together today as part of God's people, uh, of people who have just almost indescribable joys to share in how God is present with us in the midst of our lives. We also come as people who have great loads to carry, and we are eager to hear the reassurance that God is with us. So as we gather this morning, are there requests for prayers, joys or cares? Yes, Donnie. What a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Prayers for our neighbors across the alley here, the UCC, who are dealing with some water issues and, and plumbing issues. Thanks, Dottie. Are there others? Yes, Monique. Continue prayers for Craig's mom as she continues her recovery uh, from the aftermath of the stroke. Thank you. Are there others? Yes, Tom. Okay. For 
Mindy as she prepares for surgery. Okay, thanks, Tom. Yes, Mary Jo. Okay, continue prayers for Trish as she gets out of the hospital but still has healing. Healing that's needed. Okay, thanks, Mary Jo. Are there others? Yes. Okay, prayers for a family who has just found themselves to be homeless. Okay. Yes. Prayers for Linda Davis with her back issues. Okay, thanks, Brett. Are there others? We obviously have a joy this morning, and that's the joy of the baptism, and we can certainly celebrate in that. It's, it's a great time uh, for us to bring together and be mindful. It is a time of celebration. Any other prayer requests for this day? I invite you to pray. Gracious Lord, we are, we are thankful for the many ways that you are present with us, those ways that we anticipate and look forward to, and those ways that just plain surprise us. We're grateful. We thank you for your gift of love. We celebrate uh, Sawyer's baptism and all that that means for him and all that that means for us. We also give our thanks to you for those who have heard that invitation to, to share their stories, to share themselves uh, through, through the teaching of, of young lives and young faiths. We give our thanks for them as well. We are grateful for those who have heard your invitation to be that living witness of hands and feet of, of love and grace. And we give our thanks for those in the Stephen ministry, for the work of the Trinity United Methodist Church, for, for women at the well, for the missionary efforts of Mark Stransky and Larry Keyes. We pray, Lord, that there might be all, of them, all the more those who accept that invitation to, to step into that role of teaching, that our, our young lives and young faiths might have those to look to, to to settle their questions, to also identify the questions that do need to be asked. Lord, we lift up this, this family that has suddenly found itself homeless, that they might find the, the relief that they need and, and the support. We pray for our, our neighbors in faith across the alley as they deal with the challenges of their water and plumbing problems on, on this day uh, as they welcome a new pastor. We lift up Natasha and Americus and Cheyenne uh, and all that is before them as well. We join with Twyla Rosen now as she lifts up uh, a niece that found themselves unexpectedly going to the emergency room last night. We pray for, for that niece as well as her family. We also pray for, for Len Merrick as he deals with, with his bone cancer, but also a recent fall that has resulted in a, in a broken limb and, and the pain. We ask for relief from the pain. Lord, we have named before you a number of folk with health concerns. We pray that each and every one of them might, might feel your healing touch in such a way that that they find a new wholeness in body and in soul. In addition to that list, we also lift up Craig's mom as she continues her recovery uh, emotionally and spiritually as well as her physical recovery from, from her stroke. We hold before you Mindy uh, with her upcoming surgery that uh, she might have the peace of mind that she needs but also the guidance of her medical team and also support for her family as they offer their love for her. We continue our prayers for Trish as as she exits the hospital, but continues that task of, of healing. We pray for a college-age nephew uh, who has just discovered that he is dealing with stage four cancer. And we hold Linda Davis in our prayers uh, with, her, with her back pain and, and needs there this morning. We're also mindful that there are those going through times of loss and grief. We hold up the, the family of Vivian King, and we pray that they might each find the peace that their hearts require during this time of sorrow and loss. Lord, we pray for United Methodist Church, for the Commission on the Way Forward, for the Council of Bishops, for our delegates to the General Conference, that as they all work together to discern what it means for us as United Methodists to go forth into this world with a message of love and grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray for our Bishop Lori Holler, for our District Superintendent, Reverend He Chan Jung, as they both offer themselves to the ministries of this district, the Family Conference, the United Methodist Church, the world beyond. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon all of those who respond to the health, mental health um, 
needs of this community, members of the Mental Health Consortium, other providers for friends, family. We pray that the all might be blessed in those, in those efforts. We are aware that there are those who are dealing with, with long-term needs in life. We pray that they might have not only the strength for those days, but the courage to rest upon you through them. We lift before you Peyton, Hunter, and Jake. Lord, we ask that wherever there is conflict and strife in this world, whether it's within a family, whether it's within a community, whether it's between nations, that in each of those places, your peace would manifest itself. We pray that those who have found themselves displaced as refugees or immigrants, that they might find the safe sanctuary that they are seeking. And Lord, we do ask that all of those whose lives have been touched by the violence of terrorism, directly or indirectly, that as they gather the pieces and begin to rebuild their lives, they do so upon a strong foundation of your love, grace, and mercy. We pray for all of these things and for those things we hold upon our hearts as we praise your son Thomas, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as the ushers wait upon us, we are reminded that this is a time of not only offering our gifts to God, but also offering ourselves, our very lives, to the work of God's kingdom. Let us pray together. As we have received grace upon grace, send these gifts into your world that they may bring grace and mercy, healing and hope, strength and courage. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. And now as you prepare to, to go to whatever waits for you beyond these doors, that you go from here in the name of Jesus Christ as a living witness to the presence of God in this world to God's love, to God's grace, to God's mercy. Sometimes that, that witness will be your willingness to accept from others their love, their support, as you deal with the really hard, challenging parts of life. At other times, that living witness will be your, your hands and your willingness to engage them where life is too much for them to bear alone. But you go from here with God's love wrapped around you, with your Christ walking with you, with God's own spirit filling and carrying you along the way. You go from here in the full power of Jesus' name to be that loving witness. So go, go boldly that this world might know 